<laughs> Feisty. No, I haven't had Dr. Pepper all day. I would, I would like to. I would very much like to have, but, uh, you know. Oh, well, you know. Is he? Oh, that's good. Baruch Hashem. Yeah, sure, of course. How could anybody not like Dr. Pepper? I don't know. Okay, all right. Yeah. So I'm going to send Dr. Pepper. We're going to put this up on the Internet, you know, and I'm going to send Dr. Pepper a bill for my services in promoting their product. Yeah. Pirkei Avot. We're studying Pirkei Avot, believe it or not. We've come to Chapter 2 of Pirkei Avot. Mishnah number one. We just started to talk about Rabbi Judah, Yehuda Hanasi, Rabbi Judah the Prince, who is just simply referred to as Rabbi, Rabbi. And we want to look at the very first Mishnah. I want to read it again in its entirety, and then we're going to come back and we're going to seriously apply ourselves, maybe, hopefully, to looking at the commentary of the Maharal of Prague as put together for us by a nice rabbi named Rabbi Tuvia Basser in this book, the Maharal of Prague on Pirkei Avot. Okay? Here's the Mishnah. Rabbi says, which is the proper path that a man should choose for himself? And I'm going to use their translation even though it's killing me. All right? Because when I see whatever is a credit to himself, literally, he says, uh, whatever is beautiful. Tiferet. It's, it's not just a word for credit. It, it, it means tiferet, you know. It's one of the svirot. It means harmony, beauty, uh, all of those things. Okay, so now that I didn't use their translation, I'll use their translation. Whatever, so which, should, which is the proper path? The right path, uh, the, the, the upright path, literally, Derek Yeshara, that a man should choose for himself, that a human being, an Adam, should choose for himself. Whatever is a credit to himself and earns him the esteem of fellow men, be as scrupulous, he says, as perf in performing a what we would think of as a minor mitzvah, as in a major one, or a light mitzvah, he's saying actually, as in a heavy one, okay? Because you do not know the reward that is given for the respective mitzvot. Calculate the loss due to a mitzvah against its reward, and the reward of a sin against its cost, and consider, he says, three things, and you will not come into the grip of sin. Know what is above you a seeing eye, a, a, a listening ear, and all your deeds are recorded in a book. Okay, now let's come back. Rabbi says, which is the proper path that a man should choose for himself? And we're on page uh, 72, if you're looking for it, where it says, it says, Ezohi Derek Yeshara, which is the proper path. He says, Maharal understands the Hebrew Derek Yeshara, upright path, okay, to describe, he says, a path that is the proper balance of a whole range of perspectives. Following the path of the Torah leads to eternal life in the world to come. Torah, however, is not like a railroad track that guides a train automatically to its destination. It is rather like a map which requires human ingenuity. You have to engage your brain in human ingenuity to navigate by selecting a path among many possible paths, each of which is paved with Torah and mitzvot. And then he has a note there that says, of course, there are also countless non-Torah paths that will lead to a dead end. All right? I want, to say, I want to say just one thing here. The Maharal is actually saying something very, very profound, and I'm not sure we're, we're catching it. He's saying something extremely pr profound because so many people would think, okay, the Torah path, it's only one path. All right? And everybody has to be on this train, and everybody has to have a ticket in this, you know, uh, in every ticket has to be the same. In other words, everybody, th that's not what the Maharal is saying at all. He says, it's a map, all right? And there's not just one track that leads to the destination. There are countless tracks that are, that are Torah paths, as well as countless tracks that are non-Torah paths. And everybody is not the same. 
and everybody doesn't ha isn't in the same circumstances, and everybody's not at the same spiritual level, and everybody's not able to keep a mitzvah easily as somebody else is able to keep it easily. So that's not the point that, that the Maharal is trying to say uh, at all. He's, he's actually saying everyone is different and that it's wrong for us to think that for somebody to get there, they have to be just like us. A path, he says, though, is defined by boundaries that constrain movement to ensure that one keeps within the path. The left side excludes everything to the left, and the right side excludes everything to the right, and the path is the narrow space that is between those two sides. The Maharal's language here, you know, I think of Rebbe Nachman, who, what was one of his sayings? Gesher Tsar Meod. The whole world is just a narrow bridge. All right? In other words, all your life experiences in this physical world, the whole physical world is designed that you should walk this narrow bridge. But then he says, uh, what's the most important thing? Don't be afraid of anything. So, you, so the whole world, all your life experiences, everything you're going through in this world is a narrow bridge, meaning from here to the world to come. But he says the most important thing is don't be afraid of anything other than Hashem. Him you should be afraid. But don't be afraid of anything on the narrow bridge. Big deal. Okay. The, the Maharal is saying the same thing. But not everybody is necessarily on that exact same bridge is what I'm, is what I'm trying to say. And even though he's telling us everybody has their path in the Torah, and now I'm not trying to say that halakha is not halakha. Halakha is halakha. This is the way things should be done. This is the way they must be done. All right? But not everybody f even fulfills the mitzvot with the same intensity, with the same sincerity, uh, all of those things. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I'm trying to get away from this idea that, that uh, Judaism teaches that you have to be just like me. Judaism to me, I, I don't see that it teaches that at all. If you just have to, but you have a microphone and you need to use it because otherwise we'll be in trouble with the production uh, manager. Okay. I don't want to put you on the spot. Of course you do. You, you do it all the time. What do you mean? No, put me on the spot. Go ahead. Could you give me an example of a non-Torah path? There's tons of non-Torah paths. Oh, so, no, that doesn't mean anything. Oh. It has an on and an off. Okay, could you give me an example of a non-Torah path? And I should answer well, for well, someone I, who can't even turn the microphone on. I don't know. Uh, you know, okay, atheists. I, an atheist path would certainly be so. Some, anyone who is like in double concealment, who doesn't see God in the world and not connected to Him and not connected to their own soul, anything like that. Um, Where there's lots um, of religions. I'm going to tell you, well, there's a lot of religions that are non-Torah paths also. Thank you. Yeah. Now you need to turn it off. Okay. Okay. No, absolutely. Of course there's not a lot of religions that are non-Torah paths. But even them, you know... Well, I don't know. We could get off into this question and be gone for a long time, and I'm going to have to bring lots of different sides of arguments. Let's just, let's, let's go back here. Okay? All right. Anyway, my point was, before you ask your question, is that there is a right way and a wrong way to keep the mitzvot, and we do have a boundary, and we do have a path. But my point was, is I don't think the sages are actually saying that everybody has to do everything just exactly the way I do it. And that if you miss one, you know, if you're not able to do that, then you're not on the path. You're not on a Torah path. I don't think that's what any of them are saying at all. All right? At the same time, we need to take everything that they are telling us to heart and try to incorporate it. That's what incorporating the Torah into your life means. Try to incorporate, incorporate that into your life. Okay. 
He said, this Mishnah tells us that there is a balanced path defined on one side <laughs> by subjective opinion, which is always different, subjective opinion of what is proper, and on the other side by external perceptions of what is proper. To choose the right path is to do the right thing in the right way. A lot of people do try to do lots of right things and do them in the wrong way. Do the right thing in the right way. How is that done? By testing the integrity of our choices against personal and public standards. This is actually such good advice I can't begin to tell you, especially for, for uh, people who are in any kinds of positions of authority over other people. Whether that means, you know, uh, say you're a, a Torah teacher or a Torah leader or, or some, something like that uh, in a, with a class or a community or whatever, any, anything like that. This is such good advice I can't begin to tell you because many, many times what happens in groups is that uh, even, like even in a family even, uh, is that you might try to do, the, do something right, but you might do it in a wrong way. Why? Because you're being perceived as wrong by your audience, those people that it's affecting. And, and uh, both from subjective opinion, he is saying, and from external perception. So try to do the right thing in the right way. By, and how is that done? By testing the integrity of our choices against personal, your own personal Torah knowledge, but also public standards. How's that gonna go over? How's that gonna, and instead of taking the attitude as well, I don't care how it goes over, that should not be our attitude. The way we affect other people should be important to us. Beca because of damage, or because we're either building them or damaging them, one of the two, okay. Let's see what the Maharal, I'm sure he's going to have more to say on this. Let's see. He said, the choice of a balanced path must be confirmed by the judgment of other people. He says, we may ask, if a person does that which he knows to be good, why does he need to consider, why, do, why even, does he even, even need to consider the opinion of others? And the answer is that behavior must be acceptable to, to the community as well as to God because behavior can be truly upright, and at the same time, it said it, it can yet arouse suspicion or contempt, all right? For example, a modest person might ensure that no one knows of his generous donations to charity, and that's good. Yet, if no one sees him ever giving charity, people may su suspect him of not donating at all. They may think he's a tightwad. All right. By the way, he says this is the author's example. This is Rabbi Basser's example, not the Maharal's. Although this person might choose to conceal the extent of his generosity, he should probably not keep all of his charitable acts undercover. I, I understand exactly what he's saying. I can think of a thousand more just from, just because I've had experiences with groups, okay, for so long on what can happen and how easy it is for people to perceive you in a wrong way, especially if you're trying to do something right, but you end up doing it in a wrong way. And you may be completely and totally, I mean, this is how we learn, but you may complete, be completely and totally oblivious to what other people are thinking, but it is important. A Torah scholar, he says, in particular, must be careful. He could desecrate God's name by acting in a way that might give the appearance, it might not be so, but he might give the appearance to be improper or to be unpleasant. And this could be a desecration of God's name. How? On what the Torah scholar did? No. But on the perception of people, the way they perceive it. For example, and this is also the author's example, but he's basing this on a passage in the Talmud, in uh, Yoma 86a. For example, people could suspect a Torah scholar of trying to avoid payment. If he buys groceries on credit from a storekeeper who is lax about collecting de debts, since a Torah scholar is the living model of God's word, then God's name could be defamed as a result of this totally innocent act. 
All right, do we understand what the point he's trying to make? You really, especially Torah scholars, you really have to be careful of the impression that you make on other people. Therefore, he says, when we choose a proper path, we must consider how others will perceive our behavior. Let's read what he says again, which is the proper path that a man should choose for himself, whatever is a credit to himself, and earns him the esteem of fellow men. Whatever is beautiful in his eyes and in their eyes. That's what it's saying. Conversely, he says, or he, uh, yeah, the Maharal, conversely, we may ask, if others approve of his actions, then why must he himself, why does, why does it have to be beautiful in his own eyes? Why must he himself consider his deeds honorable as well? And here's the reason. The reason is that the proper path, it has to originate this is why it must be beautiful in your eyes. It must originate in the sincere pursuit of goodness because an external observer cannot ascertain sincerity. You see what he's saying? Somebody who's watching, you know, you may be the biggest fake in the world. I mean, you're, you're doing everything that's right and everybody's saying, oh, that's beautiful in our eyes. That looks wonderful. That's a good person. That's a tzaddik. I mean, uh, he's a real tzaddik. And yet, you may not be that at all. So, that's why Rabbi Yehuna Hanasi, Hanasi says, whatever is a credit to himself, it, it, you have to be, it has to be beautiful in your eyes. You have to have a level of sincerity. A sincere person directs his acts, and this is, a tzaddik for the sake of heaven in order to please Hashem. A person who wishes to gain approval by appearing, just appearing to be righteous, is not on the proper path. One's actions, he says, must receive public esteem but must not be motivated by public esteem. In other words, you're not doing what you're doing and acting the way you're doing and choosing the path that you're walking just to get others approve, other people's approval. You do it for the sake of heaven. That's the sincerity in your own eyes where it's a credit to yourself. And then that must needs also go that you're also beautiful in the eyes of other people lest Hashem's name be desecrated. With me? Okay. The esteem of fellow men. He says the choice of the Hebrew Adam literally is what it says, for fellow men, he says, connotes refined and discerning people. We know there's a difference. I mean, Adam is always the word, by the way, it's always the word that's used both f for everybody. I mean, uh, but it's a level, it's a real human being, in other words, the level of a real human being. In contrast, he says, to the more t general term, briot. Briot means creations, all right? Those, uh, those who know and discern laudable behavior, he said, set the standard of what is commendable. The opinion of coarse people does not provide a standard. See what he's saying? You may, <laughs> you may, uh, you may be doing things, uh, you may be a perfectly righteous person, but because of, because of your actions on the outside or anyway, the way the community perceives you, it must be, it must be the, the B'nai Adam, the human beings in the community that perceive you correctly. Not uh, the criminals, not the drug addicts, not the, you, you, under, you know, you understand what, I, what he's trying oh, to say. Correct yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Our political correctness people, okay. So in summary, he says, a proper path can be discerned when these factors are present together. Number one, the action arises from sincere, and he says religious motivation, but sincere motivation to serve Hashem, to please Hashem. When one personally considers it a proper path, when it is pleasing to refined and discerning people, to people in their right minds, okay? To people who have some sechel, uh, some uh, intelligence. And when it is not motivated by the fact that it is pleasing to others. It's not necessarily that you're trying to please others. That can't be the motivation. It's in order to please Hashem. But it shouldn't, you shouldn't go out of your way to displease others also, is the idea.
Okay. He goes on, he, he wants to talk about this voice shift because there's a shift in voice. He says from the third person where it says that a man should choose and now the, the Mishnah shifts to the imperative where he says be as scrupulous in performing a minor mitzvah. It signals a shift, he says, from the realm of personal choice. Now we move to this is not personal choice. This is what it, the way it must be. You see, before we, when we were talking about the Torah paths, there is, a, there is a area of choice that we have there. But now when we come to this, what, he, what he's moving to now, there's not choice. It's mandatory observance is what it's saying of the mitzvot. He says, there are many ways to do the right thing, and we should choose, always choose the best way according to circumstances. But Torah law, the halakha, in other words, by contrast, it's mandatory. And the Mishnah adjures us to be as careful to perform a minor mitzvah as a major one. There is no room here for personal choice to pick and choose among mitzvot. And by the way, this is what we have within Judaism today. <laughs> within Judaism today, you know, you'll hear the ultra-Orthodox, the Orthodox, conservatives, reform, reconstruction, on and on. And basically, when we move outside the area of orthodoxy, we have what my rabbi calls cafeteria religion, where we go through and all the mitzvot are in a cafeteria, you know, and we go through and we pick, oh, you know, well, now that mitzvah, I like that one. I'll keep that one and do that one. That one over there is a real pain. It's hard to do. It costs a lot of money. It interrupts my Shabbat. I mean, uh, what I want to do on the Shabbat. So I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll pass that one. And that's certainly not what I meant, especially speaking to Jewish people, that's not what I meant about the choices that we have in the Torah paths that are available. That's not what I meant at all. Uh, but in this case, the rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, says absolutely no cafeteria religion. Uh, you can't pick and choose among the mitzvot, and you have to be as careful with a minor mitzvah as in a major one. Uh, he says, there is no room here. Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi addresses both the subjective and the absolute aspects of religious life, and he advocates that we do what we believe is right in a way that takes social sensibilities into consideration. And he calls for, and then at the same time, he calls for compliance with all Torah law. Upright behavior, he says, comes first in the Mishnah because proper social conduct should precede Torah observance. And a lot of people don't think that that's so, but that is so. In fact, he is fixing the quote down here, a Midrash, Vayikra Rabbah, section 9, which says, proper social conduct, Derek Eretz. Derek Eretz literally means the way of the land. It means good manners, all right? manners, the way we conduct ourselves with other people. Proper social conduct, the, the, uh, the Midrash says, uh, preceded the Torah by 26 generations, meaning the 26 generations from Adam to Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay? So this point is dealt with, uh, with more fully, it says in the commentary to the next Mishnah, so we'll, we'll see that point more. But the, the idea is, from those 26 generations from Adam, to the time of Moses, actually maybe it's to Abraham, but until we get the written Torah, all right, what did the people do? How did they know? Well, they had Torah, but it was in the form of Derek Eretz. The rules on how we function as a society, how we get along with each other, how we treat other people, how, how we expect to be treated. And that comes before the giving of the Torah itself with the 613 mitzvot. Very interesting, they point that out. And this is why Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi begins first with that and then moves, then moves to strict observance, Torah observance, okay? All right. Although all the mitzvot must be observed, he says, with equal diligence, some mitzvot do defer to other mitzvot when a conflict arises. For example, Burying a dead person when, when there is no one else to tend to the funeral 
takes, actually takes precedence over such major mitzvot as the Pesach sacrifice or even ritual circumcision a Brit Milah. This fact, he says, does not contradict our Mishnah because the Torah's order of precedence is not determined by which mitzvah offers the greater reward. That's not, that's not it at all. It is very possible that there is a greater reward for the Pesach sacrifice than for burying an abandoned body. But nevertheless, the Torah commands that a body be buried without delay. Certainly, we on our own have no basis by which to decide to do one mitzvah rather than another. But what he's saying is sometimes mitz mitzvot do defer. Like on the Shabbat, if there is a life-threatening situation on the Shabbat, we're not only can we help that situation, we are commanded to help that situation. We're actually commanded to desecrate the Shabbat in order to preserve a life. Pikuach nefesh is the idea. So this is the idea. Now, so what do we know? Does that mean because we're commanded to save a life on the Shabbat, does that mean that saving a life is, has a greater reward <laughs> than the observance of Shabbat? No, we, because we don't know. We have no idea. That's, that's what the, the rabbi is trying to make this point. We don't have any idea, but we do know that saving a life is, in a sense, more important in this world than to keep the Shabbat and turn, your, turn away from it. Because a human being is more important than the Shabbat. That's the idea. Okay, but as far as the reward for the mitzvot, we don't have a clue. The reason, he says, that we do not know the reward for mitzvot is that reward awaits us in the world to come, which we cannot comprehend from our perspective in this world. God created the world, he says, so that people could come close to him in the world to come by doing mitzvot in this world. Ultimately, it is God's perspective, it's God's perspective, which determines the value of a mitzvah, and it's not our perception, because our perception is limited. The following midrash, he says, and this comes from Tan Chumat on Akev, illustrates that we do not share God's perspective on the whole of creation, and because of that, we cannot assess the value of one kind of a mitzvah in isolation. So here's the midrash. It says, Rav Acha said, it is like a king who brought workers into his orchard. And he didn't reveal to them the payment for tending each kind of tree. Every, every tree had a different level of payment. But he didn't tell them. Had he revealed the pay scale, the workers would have tended to only the most profitable type of tree. The result would have been that, that part of the orchard would have been maintained and part of it would have been neglected. And so it is that Hashem did not reveal the reward for the mitzvot. Because if he did, those that may have a small reward, we wouldn't do them. But they are just as important as the, as the greater ones. We have to tie in here, and we're not going to get to it for a little while, I think. But I want to mention it here uh, before we get to it. We have to explain because, you know, in, the, in Pirkei Avot, uh, in chapter 1, who was it uh, who said, let me find him right quick, it was Antigonus who used to say, don't be like a servant who serves their master for the sake of receiving a reward. Instead, be like servants who serve their master not for the sake of receiving a reward. So now what are we talking about being aware that they're a reward for the mitzvot? And that has to be reconciled because Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi is not telling us that that should be our motivation. He's, he's really not telling us that that should be our motivation for serving Hashem with the mitzvot. He is simply telling us that we may perceive a mitzvah as being a major one, and we may perceive as another one being as a light one. But Hashem gave us all the mitzvot, and we are just as much, should just as much run to do the light one as we run to do what we perceive as a major one, a heavy one. That's what he's saying, because we don't know the reward that's given. That's what he's trying to tell us. We don't really know the level of the importance of all the mitzvot. We just know that all these trees in his garden, 
he gave us the job to tend them is the idea. And if we only do one, we're not doing the rest. And I think of this, this idea, neither are any of the mitzvot out of date. And that includes, the, you know, the majority of the mitzvot actually of the Torah actually have to do with the Holy Temple and the service of the Holy Temple. They also are not out of date. And even though we're not able to do them like we want to, uh, this is just something, a personal pet peeve of mine. We should be doing everything we possibly can to reinstate those mitzvot, those commandments, by reinstating the Holy Temple. Because uh, God didn't say, you know, He didn't say to us, you know, oh, this major part of the Torah, uh, like uh, three quarters of it, uh, just don't worry about that anymore. You don't have to be concerned with all that, you know. And while it's true, we don't necessarily have to be concerned with it because we're not able to, because we don't have the Holy Temple. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be trying every way we possibly can to where we can reinstate three quarters of the Torah. Just a pet peeve of mine, that's all. So uh, he goes on and he, he mentions here, he said one thing, and we'll end with this. He says, the reward for a mitzvah is commensurate with its ability to bring a person close to God. That's, that's the real reward, is level of closeness to God. It is entirely possible, he says, that a minor mitzvah brings a person closer to God than does a major one. There is no connection between how close the mitzvah itself brings a person to God and how difficult or simple it is to do. I tell you what, we're going to stop right there because we're almost out of time. I'm going to mark this if I can borrow John's pen. And, uh, and this is where we'll start because it's a good place for us to, to pick up again. Okay? And uh, Baruch Hashem, it was a good class. We're all still happy with each other? Happy. Nobody's too mad at me? Okay, that's good. That's good. All right. So Shalom Uvrakah, peace and the blessing. Bye-bye. Thank you, John.